when you grew up as a fisherman and you have one skill and that is to fish, it doesn't seem that crazy that when you come of age, you're going to keep fishing. And the way you fish in Ghana is by buying small kids. The reality of hours before most of us get out of bed. Kids out on a fishing boat working already is just, I mean, that's difficult to even wrap our minds around. They're often cold and they're working in the water and there's water splashing on them and they don't have a lot of clothes and some I and a lot of the kids have described to us just how miserable it is. That's just, that's the reality of their life, is just work, work, work. Some do know how to swim, but not all of them. They tie a rope around her waist, then they dump her into the water. So any time the master told her to go fishing with him, she, start, she got afraid, she was afraid. Once one was dumped into the water and he got entangled in a net down and died. I remember the name, he was called Richard. I know, we're always playing together. But mostly if, when I sleep, I, I dream as though I've seen him around me. Until you actually do a rescue, you're hoping and dreaming and you've got an idea that you hope works. But until you actually walk out of the village with those kids, there's no way to be able to say, yeah, this is what we've been doing for two years. out of the village is the first time we're going to be able to say we've not been working for nothing I mean this is this is what we've been doing for two years and it worked we've eaten your banku we've even slept in some of your beds and we're so grateful for the ways that you've treated us like friends as we told you the first time we came, we want to do economic empowerment for this community. We've helped the community go on the journey from shame to pride. Is this good catch? Yes. These ones are be put in the cage. They've got these kids, they know they probably shouldn't have them, but they just don't know what to do. And now they can be proud of the fact that they have these cages, that they're monitoring these cages, they're taking care of these cages, they're growing these fish. And because of that, they're able to release the children voluntarily, so they weren't forced to do anything. And so they get the pride of saying, we did this. Like, we are actually releasing these children so that they can go on and have opportunities that we never had. I want them to go to school for future bright. That the future might be bright. Hmm. And so I think that difference of leaving them in shame, frustration, anger, versus where they're actually hopeful that the kids will go on and be successful in life, that's a totally different scenario. And it's one in which you're really leaving the not just the kids, but the entire community is in a better place than they were when, when you got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
were very happy when we had to trade off uh, the children for the cages because we knew that uh, at the end of the harvest period we will have money that will be able to take care of the community and our families. In that two, three hundred yard walk, how do you describe that culmination in this procession of 24 kids who are literally making this freedom walk from being captive to becoming free. From the center of the village to the shore where they were going to get into that boat. That was a walk where all kinds of life possibilities opened up and where suddenly they could actually begin to dream again. We partnered with a Ghanaian nonprofit called Challenging Heights. The founder was actually a traffic child himself. It's just an amazing um, thing to be able to see through the eyes of those children all these new things that they had never seen before. Simple, simple things that we take for granted that now they're going to get to experience every single day. The good news is that we rescued 24 kids. The bad news is that there's 6,976 kids left by the best estimates, uh, starting with 7,000. And that means our work is nowhere close to being done.